Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Nick Dulovich, part of the team at Cherokee Media Group and senior editor of AutoFin Journal and Subprime Auto Finance News. In today's webinar, Top Underwriting Trends for 2020, we're going to learn more from Evan Krapko and Chris Matichuk of Trust Science. But before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items to go over for today's webinar. Please make sure you've dialed in using the phone number provided in your communication email, or you're able to listen to us via your PC speakers. We are recording today's webinar, and we'll make that recording available to you as soon as possible. You will be in listen-only mode for this webinar, but we will reserve some time after the presentation for a Q&A segment. You can submit your questions at any time through the questions box on the GoToWebinar control panel. And if we aren't able to get to your question today, don't worry, because we'll forward it on to the team at Trust Science so the company can respond back to you directly via email. And lastly, if you have any difficulty during today's webinar, please click on the hand icon on the GoToWebinar control panel. So again, we'll be discussing what you should be thinking about for 2020 topics such as explainable AI and why you should care about it, as well as going beyond accept and decline for your business growth. So let's introduce a special welcome to our panelists, Evan Kropko, who is the chairman, founder, and CEO of Trust Science, as well as CTO, Chris Matichuk. Evan started Trust Science with his brother, Shane. Evan is a serial entrepreneur and investor having served as CEO or advisor for numerous innovative startups, including Flow Networks, which was acquired by DoubleClick for $80 million, and PlateSpin, acquired by Novell for $205 million. Chris is a veteran technologist with more than 20 years of experience building global, scalable platforms. He is responsible for product innovation and development at Trust Science. Chris holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Science from the University of Alberta, as well as an MBA in Marketing from Santa Clara University. Chris is the lead or co-inventor of nine U.S. patents. So again, our panel discussion will last for about 30 minutes, and then we'll get into a Q&A session after our presentation on the trends for underwriting in 2020. And just to quickly recap, for those of you who are new to Trust Science, the company provides subprime finance companies an online platform that can enable machine learning and AI for credit scoring that integrates into your decisioning process. The platform can enable more insights and accurate scoring of consumers, including individuals with thin or even no file credit backgrounds. So let's get started. Chris and Evan, over to you to share what are the top underwriting trends for 2020. Hi, this is Chris Matichuk. Thanks, Nick. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity and uh, welcome everyone to the next uh, 30 minutes. We'll try and get through this as fast as uh, possible and let everyone get back to end of year uh, busyness. So starting with the uh, first trend. So we have five trends that we'll, we'll go over. For this first one, uh, multiple alternative uh, data sources are necessary to expand credit profiles coverage and enable automated loan underwriting. So this is what we, this is the, the really the core, the foundation of what we do. So I wanted to kind of start with this and this in, a, in its sense is a, in its essence is, is pretty clear that this, we want to continue to expand and improve on this. In particular, what does it mean to uh, to really to be automating your loan uh, underwriting? What you're what you're trying to do here is better predict what you can decline automatically, predict what you can approve automatically, and then there's a middle where you know, there may be some amount of uncertainty, and and you need to send that to an agent for decisioning. Um, and in order to automate more of it, you you want to reduce the amount of the area that you're uncertain and really increase your certainty on where you can automatically approve or decline. Um, when you start out with it, because we're predicting a financial decision in, in lending, um, using financial data is typically the, the best to start with and bureaus are a good source of that data. 
Um, but the thing is, what happens when you start going into thin file or no file and subprime? What happens in this case is the financial data is incomplete. It really doesn't give a full profile of the person's uh, uh, where they're at and, and, and really for this type of loan, and sometimes it's a smaller loan, um, will they default or will this be a good customer, a good lifetime customer? So it's important to start looking at alternate data. And, and what is alternate data? It's data that cannot, it's not directly related to a consumer's credit behavior. That, that would be a general definition. And the types of data that would look like is uh, transactional data, maybe banking data, telco data, utility data, um, public data, and, and social data even. Um, and on those different types of data, you'll have structured data. And what I mean by structured data is data that has existing features that have already been extracted from the information, and you can use that for decisioning. And also unstructured data, where really there isn't any features in there to really extract, and you have to you have to um, maybe apply some type of NLP or some type of uh, other additional processing to pull the data information you need out of it. When we're looking at the unstructured data and, and we're trying to extract our information, it, two things you're basically looking for is the ability to repay and the willingness to repay, which is what you're also trying to measure when you're looking at financial or any of these data sources. But when you're talking about unstructured, there's a lot of extra work that has to go into it. And so you're, you're trying to look at those types of features. Um, and so that's, you know, that's overall at, 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 this, at the high level, what we're looking for when we're trying to automate, we're, we're not just looking at, at the financial side, because a lot of times when you're, when you don't have the full profile or the full credit information, you have to you have to look at other angles and that's where the alternate data, and it's not just one alternate data source. What you'll find is that um, one data source may give one picture of a user, but really you need more than one alternate data source to really get the complete picture. And the more that you can add, the better. Um, you know, uh, the other side of this as well is as you're improving is uh, is applying a continuous improvement. And in general, there's there's three different ways that you can do that. First, as you're moving along, continuing to uh, update with the new performance information and not really locking into a score for five years, which traditionally has happened, but really uh, as the whole industry is moving and, and things are becoming more dynamic in the world, it's very important to be very flexible with the customer base and and uh, and where things are heading so continuing to update that is important um, also looking at uh, better uses of the data you already have and always looking to always look to add new data that has um, more a different view than the data that you currently have and again this is a lot of times where social comes in uh, where uh, not every place looks at social but that does provide a very very important other uh, view of the user um, outside of what have a lot of lenders use today. Um, anyway, I think that at, at a high level, we can summarize point one here that um, there's been uh, a move to say offshoring or getting as inexpensive as you can on your humans or the loans officers and adjudicators. Um, it's for the more advanced or further ahead uh, lenders. They are uh, pursuing more aggressively, at least we're seeing in 2020, lots of plans for as much as can be done to automate uh, credit decisioning. The, we're not predicting for 2020 the depth of scorecarding. <laughs> That's um, uh, now of a very, very old and, and uh, uh, well understood way to do reach decisions, at least where you do have a consistent set of data coming in, but the world is uh, changing to lots of other kinds of data becoming available and some of the old tried and true sources of data no longer being available anymore. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, on a subsequent slide. So we're at the point now where we'll move to um, uh, the, next, the next slide. Um, there's been a uh, I guess you'd call it a, an earthquake <laughs> in, uh, over the weekend that happened in this space with the uh, five uh, five agencies press release that probably all of you have seen by now or should have. They issued a joint statement on the use of alternative data 
in credit underwriting. Um, that's something, again, a little more detail on a subsequent slide, but um, the priority when you're going into this kind of thinking has to come, has to uh, emphasize your compliance people as well as your risk people. Uh, those are obviously a team. Sometimes they're in uh, the same person, depending on how big your shop is. Um, but trend number two here is one around um, privacy and getting to compliant solutions or com compliant uh, decisioning support. Yeah, so, you know, governance is, is, everybody has some degree of governance. And when you think of that, you think purely of, of testing for bias. And that continues to be a very, very important part of this. But it's more than bias. It's also testing for privacy with what's happened with a lot of the data breaches that are, for example, uh, coming along. People are more and more concerned about ha what is happening with my data. And so ensuring that you're ensuring that you're anonymizing the data and, and, uh, and there's transparency with how you're processing the data. Um, this is, these are all very, very important to be able to have that. And that's just, this is just a growing, growing importance of, of the governance area uh, of, of any type of decisioning system. Um, you know, along with that, um, I'd like to also, you know, I can talk a bit about more about centralized versus decentralized, given this is more of a, this is more of a trends talk, because you know, this is what we're doing right now. It's around privacy, biasy, and and uh, and governance. But really, if you look a little bit further out, let's talk about five or ten years out. There's there's been a lot of move and a lot of discussions around centralized versus decentralized data. So right now, with centralized, you think of the bureaus or or the uh, these data hubs where you have all of the personal information of users is stored. And what happens is is this becomes more or less as a honeypot. Uh, the more that you have, the more data in a centralized fashion that that bad actors can get at, um, they will. And and so uh, there's a lot of if uh, some of you may have heard of uh, self-sovereign identity. This is a this is a future item that's coming down the path. Um, there are several uh, groups. We're part of the Sovereign uh, Group, for example, uh, part of the Linux Foundation, uh, where. Really, what you're doing is, is rather than having all the data stored in a centralized honeypot per se, the user stores all of their personal data on their phone or on their device, and then you use things like zero knowledge proofs in order to to uh, to access and prove the information that you need to do the credit scoring. Or it may even go at some point in the future to the point where the credit scoring algorithm may even get pushed to the user's device and then it acts within the user device to access the information that it's allowed and does the credit scoring and now the user also has some level of ownership of the even that score that then they can provide to multiple players these these are these are trends um, that are brewing for the last several years and it's starting to pick up now especially with europe with the gpdr uh there's uh with with uh, it's it's almost toxic for some of these uh, um, institutions to hold on to privacy data. And so there's a lot happening uh, in an accelerated fashion in Europe around self-sovereign identity. And, uh, and now with some of the stuff that's happening in California, um, it's, it's, it's moving there as well. And, and it's only a matter of time that it'll expand and even in, expand to Canada and other countries. And so this is another trend that's happening that we, we've been uh, spending a fair bit of time on the last two years, uh, getting ahead of the curve. Yeah, the, the, the stuff Chris was talking about, obviously those in California know, uh, for those who don't or are in other countries, is a CCPA being uh, promulgated to take effect January 1 uh, in California. Some uh, transition period allowance there. But this trend number two is uh, inevitable or it's coming on like a freight train. And uh, we think you're, you'd be well advised to at least know or make yourself aware of what's uh, happening there if you aren't already. Uh, for 2020, it will be a big, huge um, part of the world. Uh, trend number three is uh, thinking beyond mere um, scoring or probability of default as, a, as an indicator. You have to also um, now, as, as everybody's on pins and needles wondering if this is the year of the next great recession or worse or not as bad as all that um, a lot more attentiveness to 
uh, not just does this pass, does this application pass some kind of minimum threshold uh, requirements, to, lots more concern, um, especially below 680 or below 650 around um, history if you have it, but not all borrowers uh, or does intended borrowers have history. Um, you want to look at anything that will inform you around pricing or doing risk-based pricing, uh, changing your, your interest rates or terms, looking at the lifetime value not only of um, a borrower, but um, as well your relationships in the case of the indirect lenders, your relationships with your dealer network and the rest of the ecosystem that you're participating in because everybody, as we know from 2007 and 8 and, and lingering into 2009, um, when the lights go out, they go out fast and they go out in the whole building at once. It's not a case of a gradual soft landing uh, necessarily, especially if some of the uh, macro factors start kicking in. We're in an election year here coming up now and there too we know from the past that this is um, cause for or, or fodder anyway um, for a lot more heightened uh, swings that the uh, the gyrations in uh, market confidence start getting uh, felt or expressing themselves in not only your own borrowers um, psyche or mindset as a marketplace but in the institutional money at the top of the funnel or at the top of the waterfall uh, on wall street and bay street and around the world you're, you're seeing the disruptions that might be um causing ripples the the, the uh the the, the um the reference to uh when a butterfly flaps its wings in the Amazon, what is the effect to you over here? Well, when protesters are throwing uh, firebombs at police in different countries, more than more than just one or two at the moment, a lot of intense um, intensity around uh, the system as a whole that then drives itself down into at your level, trend number three here is thinking well past uh, the simplistic thresholds or key performance indicators that have served us well for a relatively stable 10-year period of time here. Well, so I, I want to add one more point in there. A lot of people do, in the, when you look at a scorecard or, or traditional rules, there's a lot of hard, fast rules that are declined. Uh, and, and when you move into more of a machine learning model or AI model, there's a lot of uh, loss value in those declines as well that I think are important to take a look at, especially when you move into additional data sources and new types of scoring. Um, looking at how you can take a look at those declines and how you're doing that, I think that's an important thing as well. I'll move to the next trend four. Yeah, we're so uh, no secret to anyone on this call most likely is that um, the, the world is moving more and more to online uh, marketplaces. Uh, the millennials hate stepping into anything having to do with bricks and mortar or interacting with conventional retail and therefore other kinds of institutions. Um, we touched in trend number one on, on automating decisioning, um, but the competitive nature of now uh, lenders for good quality consumers is going to have you in settings or or push you into settings situations that demand that you have a mobile strategy or and or an online uh, if not your own marketplace you participating in something that that borrower uh, can can access and in cases they'll be doing it from outside your jurisdiction which is actually the, the power and the beauty of being present in a way that technology can reach uh, the end borrower uh, tr for for sure in 2020 as everyone's trying to drive costs out of their legacy systems their legacy lending infrastructure um, there's simply no more efficient way to do it than to be in a lot more uh, bits and bytes world as opposed to molecules and and physical physical infrastructure um, you're we're th this th this is a a speed. This is an answer to the the demand for responsiveness from today's consumer. 
I think that people were predicting this in 2015 and, and 2016 or 17, but, and you, you'll hear in a lot of different conferences that you've got to get online, you've got to do a lot more of this kind of um, orientation to your business. But that was, and, and those were valid, but I think 2020 is the year when we start seeing some of this come into a really disruptive mode because it's now really being actioned or really being released and put into the hands of, as I said, the millennials and their mobile phones. Trend five is uh, the recession talk that I said we would come back to. It's increasing uh, the concerns, um, whether or not that there's a black swan event that triggers things or whether we all just find ourselves um, you know, falling up or down on some, you know, the next curve here. Um, some Everyone's tragedy is someone else's opportunity. Um, you know that this economy in, in, uh, in a free market system is cyclical. So I think all the pundits and the experts have been proven really um, wrong or maybe a little red faced or embarrassed about getting the timing uh, off or the severity and so on. No one sensible tries to call a, a bottom or a top. You can maybe see trends in the rear view mirror. Uh, and depending how frequently you're looking in the rear view mirror, you can try and extrapolate forward. Uh, but this, um, uh, the, the gyrations with all the, the um, additional factors that we've just discussed coming up in 2020 are going to make for a lot of uh, the necessity to do things that were not not being done, truthfully not being done by a lot of different lenders until much more recently, and, and in some cases not at all, and definitely not being done by uh, the industry that that purports to do uh, credit decision support. So, um, open banking, another trend that's coming from uh, from Europe, has started there and will inevitably wash onto or be a tidal wave on these shores you're going to see access to and again something that was being supported by explicitly in the uh, the five agencies uh, press release on the weekend uh, ex expressly indicating that the banking information uh, from uh, people's banking accounts and all kinds of alternative data need to be brought to bear so um, this is in fact, I think, and the need for releasing that now as opposed to waiting until 2020, the guidance from our regulators is that we've got to get on top of things that are going to help cushion uh, what may or may not be some, some pretty ugly times up ahead. And because no one's exploited alternative data or no one's been very uh, actively focused on it or they don't know how or what to do with unconventional data that's not structured or not financial, um, there's going to be a big, huge opportunity for, for all of us, for everyone, uh, to look at what the regulators are now literally encouraging us all to do together as an industry. And uh, it's, it's pretty exciting in that way, even though this trend here, number five, is that there's a lot of risk or a lot of unknowns that lie ahead. We can give ourselves a bit of an insurance policy or buffer by taking advantage of uh, methods and data that heretofore, up until now, haven't been uh, easily accessed or accessible. Of course, that comes with uh, the need to explain yourself. Uh, these same regulators need you to have explainable AI. They need you to have something that's not a black box or a mystery. There's lots of good tools, open source tools and um, uh, things that are well proven, uh, well understood, very, very explanatory. Um, they underpin every single player in this industry who's doing AI is using exactly this kind of uh, open source and, and widely available shared know-how tools like SHAP, uh, we're a big proponent of. And it's very hard to do, don't get me wrong, the tools exist and they're open source. It's hard, but it, it's necessary. So we've taken it on to make it easy uh, for everybody else. I think that we're uh, yeah. we're at the end of uh, the, the, 
some of the canned remarks um, a little bit all over the map, but we are talking about trying to predict trends for 2020. Um, Q&A would be a good time to drill down on what's actually of interest to the audience. And th thank you so much, Evan and, and Chris, for uh, setting the table nicely for uh, not only this discussion, but uh, how finance companies, uh, executives, management need to need to consider what might be ahead in, in 2020. And, and as just a reminder that we are recording today's webinar, so please keep watch of your inbox for a link to uh, the recording of this session. And if you have questions now for Evan Krapko and Chris Matichuk from Trust Science, please use the questions box on the go to webinar control panel and we'll get to as many questions as we have in our allotted time here today and and gentlemen to to, to get the uh conversation started perhaps it's 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 in the back of the minds of of many finance company executives nowadays but just could you please address just can a rules-based uh credit scoring model uh be replaced with a machine learning based credit scoring model and if so how might that uh process unfold i i think that the answer is a resounding yes and the industry itself is proving that i think that uh, not going down that path is going to be the death knell of of any uh re resistors or or, or uh, luddites the um the fact is that you 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 don't get as good a view on the credit worthiness of an individual if you're trafficking in those well-worn now, like 25 or 50, or in cases, claims of 500 variables. They're all financial largely. They're, they're all typically negative signal largely. Uh, there are other things that get brought to bear, but not in any organized fashion. And so when you start saying that I'm now going to look at millions of variables and not the same old 50 or 500, you can't do it any other way. There's, the scorecard is just uh, hopelessly uh, lost in the dust on some of the, the, uh, the need and the ability to bring disjoint data or non-correlated non data to the fight. It's like, I, I keep saying it's uh, like bringing a gun to a knife fight. Um, and, and so, yes, I think, there's no question that this A will be getting done because B, it already is, and lots of uh, good technology and services in the marketplace to do that. Yeah, so I'd add to that, I mean, when you're using a rules space, you're not necessarily making the best use of the data. And that's where the machine learning comes in, that it'll it'll find correlations between the different attributes that you you might not find. I mean, from experience, experience is great to bring that in and, and define rules. Uh, based on what you've seen, but uh, but the machine learning will will go a long way in, in finding um, some smaller nuances that you might not have realized, or or allowing you, for example, you might have thought that you, you know it's an absolute cutoff if the person doesn't make a certain level of income, um, uh, but then you may find with machine learning that uh, that given certain other circumstances, you can actually go below what you thought was a cutoff for income. You can be a little, you can be more more lenient in there, and that's a lot easier with a machine learning model to 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 find uh, discover those types of opportunities with with uh, better data and, and better use of the data yet that you already have. The voices that you're hearing those those are from our special guests for today's webinar, Evan Kropko, who is the chairman, founder, and CEO of Trust Science, as well as Chris Matichuk, who is the CTO at Trust Science for our webinar today, Top Underwriting Trends for 2020. And uh, if you have a question for, for Evan and Chris, please use the, the questions box on the GoToWebinar control panel. And uh, uh, inquiry that, that's come in, gentlemen, I, again, uh, appears to be on the minds of, of many of uh, finance companies nowadays, as you touched on, that there is the, the discussion of, of a possible recession. Um, uh, metrics have, have looked decent thus far, but, but there could be signs ahead that uh, perhaps 2020 might be a uh, time when a recession appears. Uh, what, what suggestions do you have that uh, subprime finance companies can do to, to mitigate 
their potential loss and risk, both uh, looking short term as well as long term. If, if in fact, uh, a, a recession comes to be, what, what suggestions might you have for, for finance companies to, to get their ducks in a row and, and to mitigate risk as much as possible? I'd say at a high level, um, make sure that you're working with someone whose data has seen and spans uh, two or three, ideally, um, uh, cycles. Um, make sure that you're not on a solution that's uh, restrained in its data and its ability to take on alternative data, especially now that the regulators have allowed or encouraging, explicitly encouraging everyone to do so. Of course, they're, they're in the same breath or in the same sentence, and you can see it in their press release, the joint five agencies press release. They, they, they express that it better also be compliant. <laughs> so recession or no recession, those consumer protections need to be maintained or upheld. But um, in, in a tightening or, or constrained credit economy, if that's where we're headed, um, you want, you know, the flight to quality can be uh, scary on the one hand, or in some cases have uh, negative ripples or consequences, uh, both to consumers and or to lenders who are not well prepared with um, something that's adaptive. So with with scorecards, for example, you're, you're a, a lot in the rear view mirror, you're a lagging indicator, your models are going to be, they'll take the time they take to update and so on. But on an, on an AI based system, it's constantly relearning in real time. It takes into account the information from like previous cycles that I already mentioned. And then be, be sure that if, if your own provider of uh, decision support isn't doing this for you, that you take it on yourself, which is to gather various different forms of data. This unidimensional or uni uh, uh, one one type of factor that most of the world's scoring has been built on, which I mentioned already, uh, is going away in favor of uh, multi-dimensional data, uh, data that's uh, sometimes thin or has a very weak signal in the, in being able to being easy to be found it's not easy to be found but get onto something or build your own that lets you find those very uh very very useful but but um very uh needle in a haystack kinds of indicators that can actually tell you you know separate the wheat from the chaff yeah i'd, I'd add to that with with the updating of the models you don't want to be updating your models every two years. You want to be updating it a lot more frequent than that. Um, I, I would say even maybe every six months might even too long. And if you if you can update them uh, more frequently, the chances are there's some if if there is any signals that are coming in from your customer base, you may not see it uh, clearly. But if you retrain and with updated performance, then um, the models may find some things that you may not see as obvious, and that that would be one way to uh, protect yourself is 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 keep your keep your uh, keep the decisioning, keep the models up to date. In the last downturn, we we all heard over and over again, people are so frustrated and and feeling. I think betrayal is the right word, but maybe too strong in this context. The the fact that scores and scoring didn't seem to uh indicate that there were borrower applicants that were actually challenged under the new environmental uh, atmosphere and so when you're when you're on a system that's a little more uh, stagnant like that that's going to inevitably be the case um, so i think re reiterating or echoing chris's point just now um make sure that you're you're on something that's going to be able to learn in real time and adjust with the data that's fresh as of yesterday or fresh as of this morning and not some something that's uh, got this drag on it that lets you uh, hurt yourself with your decisioning while the world has changed around you very good again the voices uh of 
our experts t for today's webinar, uh, top underwriting trends for 2020 are Evan Kropko from and Chris Matichuk from Trust Science. And, and, and gentlemen, continuing our, our, our Q&A segment here, um, kind of, a, a, again, another compliance-oriented question, just how can machine learning uh, based uh, credits, how can a machine based credit scoring model uh, provides transparency uh, in the underwriting process. How can, how can this particular tool uh, help in, in that element of, of the underwriting process? Yeah, so with, with a rules-based approach, you can see what exactly is going into the model. You can add and subtract with the AI or machine learning. It, it can be a little bit more of a black box and you don't really quite know. And so that's where explainable AI comes into play, where where if you uh, uh, there there are ways to 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 put to add into the model um, uh, uh, tools to add into the model um, of triggers or, or items that you can then tell you once the prediction happens what exactly influenced that particular score uh, which features influenced that to score and to what degree to um, to a positive or to a negative and to what degree and so using that you can actually you can see exactly why did this model make the decision that it made. Um, and so that can then influence um, reason codes that can then be provided if there's ever an adverse action, you can provide, uh, um, based on that, provide reason codes on, on why, uh, why the score would, is what it is. You don't want to, that's not entirely the decision. A lot of times there's other factors as well with uh, there might be some manual decisions or looking at some uh, alerts and such, and those would be part of the reasons as well. But from, from the perspective of, of, of moving from a rules-based system to a machine learning system, explain well AI gives uh, a, a lot of transparency in exactly why did the model do what it does. And it's also very, very important that during the model building uh, process as well, and, and, and also with governance. So um, um, when, when, we, when we build models, we use explainable AI uh, is is an input for our governance to to take a look and and you know making sure we're not biasing for example making sure we're not using a particular feature set that may be uh, um, unexpected in a certain way and to catch uh, um, to catch uh, um, things that maybe should be changed in the model and how we're building it and so uh, this all plays together to give a lot more transparency in the development of the models process and then once the models get deployed to production provide transparency and why did the models make the decision they did? I mean, speaking, <laughs> speaking of transparency, this is not so much a trend for 2020. This is uh, very much, not, if you're not already on it, uh, you're, you're in danger of missing the boat. This is a, a long understood now field that's been necessary for being compliant, um, uh, you know, for anyone in this business. And so the, the trend is uh, for 2020 is that you'll see, you won't, you won't be a player if you're not taking advantage as a lender, if you're not taking advantage of something that's not only AI based, but uh, fully, fully explainable and compliant. It's going to allow you to do different things, by the way, uh, that includes not just reducing defaults, but being able to take on um, more borrowers that would otherwise look to you like a, a high risk because they're below 680 or below 650. You know, well understood fact in the industry is that below those scores, the conventional way of doing this is non-determinative because there's so many up to 40% of those uh, 70 million adult consumers in the US who are scored below 650, 680. 40% of them are actually prime or super prime. And so the, the trend here is, is maybe best expressed as further or accelerated adoption of this stuff, but this is not new. This, the AI-based approach and the need for explainable AI is not new. Our special guest again for today's webinar, top underwriting trends for 2020 are Chris Matichuk and Evan Krapko from Trust Science, and continuing on with our with our Q and A segment here, gentlemen, uh, uh, mentioned throughout the presentation, and certainly top of mind with finance companies as well, the the use of alternative data. Just how many uh, 
how what would how many alternative data sources are needed to to make the the tools work most efficiently what what are your suggestions there of, of how many sources of alternative data are needed to, to make the process work as as well as it can um hundreds or dozens um everyone's become comfortable or or it's been easy now to think in terms of working with one or two in the form of uh, a bureau, um, as we call ourselves Credit Bureau 2.0. You've got to literally be adept and reliable and and very, very fast at incorporating N number, an unlimited number of different data sources. And they're not necessarily going to all look like one another. In fact, the more they look like the last one, the less useful the additional one is. So you heard Chris at the top of the prepared remarks talking in terms of structured versus unstructured uh, financial and non-financial data. Um, optionally, you can also talk in terms of getting data from uh, the millennials mobile phone device with their consent and uh, permissioned access to what's on the device as well as using the device to let them uh, have you see their other sources. So uh, the, the list of sources pretty much quickly becomes endless. Uh, you're having them uh, give you what they would otherwise go home and get from paper copies of uh, bank statements, for example. You can now do that online. And, and for in a lot of ways, that is way more invasive than anything that you're going to be able to see from them on, say, the social uh, basis. The social is a lot more in their control, but um, their bank verification stuff is actually, you know, telling you precisely how their relationship with money works. Um, the, so, Nick, to answer your question, that there there is no limit or cap or number of uh, sources that you should feel comfortable stopping at. It's it's up to you or your partners to continually access and incorporate as many sources as possible, obviously economically uh, possible. Yeah, and I'd, I'd add to that that it, it, it depends. It depends if the sources you have have 100% coverage of all of your uh, customers, um, the borrowers. And when you start getting into less coverage, you need you need more additional uh, alternate data sources in order to get that complete coverage. And so um, you need as many as it go, as it's going to take. And and as long as each data source is adding a net additional. Um, uh, I, I would use the word disjoint from other data sources you have. That would be one uh, one part of it, and the other part is uh, filling out the coverage. Um, and and as your customer base may change and they may move on to different systems, you have to be agile enough to be able to um, incorporate very quickly, evaluate and incorporate additional data sources into your system, and not have a, a fixed uh, one or two data sources that you use, but be able to augment that as as uh, uh to follow you know where what is going to be the, the what's predictive in five years it may be something very different than what it is right now very good again the, the voices that you're hearing are special guests for today's webinar from trust science it's chairman founder and ceo evan Krapko, as well as the cto of the firm chris matichuk and Gentlemen, as we, we come to the closing stages of, of our webinar today, just uh, another topic that, that's, that's top of mind for many finance companies, the, the thought of cybersecurity and, and data breaches and, and how much uh, resources are, are thrown to uh, try to prevent those from happening. Just each of your perspectives, why are, are we still having uh, many data breaches and, and how much of a challenge cybersecurity is? Just each of your perspectives there. I think that um, when you're, um, let's just put this delicately. I'm choosing my words carefully. It's a good question, whoever asked that, thank you. <laughs> but um, when, when you have an architecture and a, uh, a fabric, say the, both the reporting fabric as well as uh, a centralized uh, infrastructure that's, you know, visually, although it's, this is not physically the case, visually, you know, some of these mainframes are large computing 
centers as big as buildings, let alone, you know, what's on your mobile phone for processing power, you're you're inevitably going to be what Chris called earlier a honeypot. You're going the the size of the prize is so big, and these uh, hostile actors are so determined and well rewarded for for succeeding at uh, penetrating you. It's it's very very high stakes cat and mouse game, and so I think that uh, we haven't talked about this, but and because it's not a 2020 thing, but I'd say if we allow ourselves to think a little bit further, you're going to see um, more and more of the distributed ledger technology or um, more conventionally understood as blockchain um, in, in um, infiltrating or permeating itself into this ecosystem. So we have our own project like that. We already mentioned sovereign.org. Um, and we're a founding steward of that, but the implications going forward, not in 2020, but beyond, are going to be where every person is their own credit bureau in essence. And so the centralized nature of a trust science that's small or the big tri bureaus that are very, very large, that, that centralized nature itself becomes the issue as a target or becomes ever more um, vulnerable as the, the the prize goes up for breaching successfully. And then we've seen all the headlines on the breaches as well, but the antidote to that is a trend that I'm predicting more for beyond, so call it 2022 or 2025, that has a lot more of the self-sovereign identity that we talked about at the outset of our prepared remarks and the use of the mobile phone and all of us, lenders and borrowers alike, coming together with one another facilitated that way in a blockchain based world. I'm not talking bitcoins and tokens or any of all that nonsense. I'm talking about the foundational technology that goes behind blockchain. So that in that case, uh, breaches become uh, a thing of the past. There's no place to breach. There's no one single repository that's vulnerable. There's no you know, the size of the prize is very small because you're going to have to do a hell of a lot of work just to get to one consumer's data. Very good. Well, again, that's Evan Kropko and Chris Matichuk from, from Trust Science. Gentlemen, thank you so much for all of the insights looking into uh, 2020 and, and even beyond. Thank you. Thank and if you. you'd like a, and if you'd like a personalized demo of how Trust Science can help you automate uh, your decisioning process with machine learning, credit scoring, and explainable AI for those thin file or credit invisible consumers. Go to trustscience.com slash learn hyphen more or send them a message to solutions at trustscience.com. Again, it's those details are there on the screen trustscience.com slash learn hyphen more or send them a message at solutions at trustscience.com we thank you so very much for for joining us today and we and for on behalf of all of us at cherokee media group i'm nick solovich we thank you for joining us and we look forward to having you again next time